it's mm -hmm. both a question that we ourselves were asking, you know, like, why do we work? Uh, the situation, of the pandemic, the situation of being a young person kind of coming out of college or changing careers or retiring, like that's a real question. Why work? Why do this work? Or why not, you know, do something else? But you're right, it's also like a, a statement because we all do work and implicit in that is a rationale, a reason, a purpose, but very often like that's not, we don't know that. Uh, we don't know why we work, why we do the things that we do. Uh, and a lot of the kind of easy answers that come off the, the front of the mouth are not the, the deeper answers, right? I work to pay the bills, I work to provide for my family. Those are all true, but that's not, that's not really the, like the heart of it. In 2021, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, over 47 million Americans voluntarily quit their jobs, marking an unprecedented mass exodus from the workforce. Spurred on by the COVID-19 pandemic in what is now widely being called the Great Resignation, it seemed that the relationship between workers and the labor market had failed. We were left with only questions. Many pundits argued that the exit was provoked by the virus and that jobs would return once COVID left. Others said that the exit was only part of a growing problem in America of job dissatisfaction, of a fracture between the worker and the entrepreneur. The polemics and pundits dominated while the quiet quitting continued until someone finally asked why we work. Um, I own and operate a micro dairy in uh, Needville, Texas. We milk goats every day, twice a day, and turn all their milk into goat milk popsicles. So growing up, it's every little kid's dream, I think, to be a veterinarian, and I was no different. That, that was. I had these really fond memories of going to the barber. Because uh, I had seen a play by Oscar Wilde, the importance of being earnest during high school in English and I found it hilarious and fun. And then uh, I went again during college to see it, but in Italian this time, and it was not as much enjoyable as before. And I took a break from my desk job to uh, figure out what uh, fulfilled me. Um, and somehow through uh, support and encouragement, I, I was able to be a veterinarian. I, I wouldn't really entertain the thought of anything else. So I, I was really fascinated by this work. Coincidentally, my brother came home one day and he came back from a haircut and it was a pretty shabby haircut. In that moment, I, I just, it was natural. I took the scissors and the comb and kind of looked at him and just visually, photographic memory-wise from my Italian barber, knew what to do in order to fix this. From that moment on, something changed, you know? I would say there was no um, shining light or giant overnight revelation. It was really just all in about 10 years working as a CPA, doing various kinds of work. It was very clear to me that that was not what stirred my soul. I didn't know what my calling was, I just knew it wasn't that. Um, or yeah, once you're an adult and you're out of college, that's the next question. It's like, oh, what do you do for a living? And what do you do? And it's always very humbling to say that I work in property management because it's not at all, like it doesn't line up with my other interests or what I studied. But one of my favorite authors, Wendell Berry, speaks of the muse of uh, inspiration, the muse of reality, right? So the muse of inspiration in a way was what brought me to this venture, but it was the muse of, re the muse of realization. Uh, in Wendell Berry's words, he says, it's, it's that muse that always makes you realize, oh, things are harder than I thought they were going to be. Lucy and I, I mean, couldn't have even fathom how difficult the food industry was going to be. So much so that if we'd known fully then, probably we wouldn't have done it. Like there's so many people who have to do work that they don't want to do and they don't make a lot of money. And they're, like there's people then who do work that they don't want to do and they make a lot of money. And how do I not be jealous of that? How don't I feel like envious towards either people's like certainty in their job or they're okay doing something with they, that they don't really want to do, but it like makes money.
and I thought what I wanted was money. That's not really what I wanted. What I wanted was to find my significance. And I thought things gave me significance and worth. And so eventually my activities led to a loss of someone's life. One thing is that the profit is an indication that I'm doing what society wants. But if I'm pursuing profit for the sake of profit, you know, for, for self-gratification, that's not sanctification. I see a Mercedes 500 and I like it. But we have to remind it that happiness is not in that. The dignity of workers must be recognized in all forms of work that exist today. The trajectory of work spans a lifetime, from childhood chores to volunteering in retirement. Should age or ability be a limitation on finding value in work? I've enjoyed my life. Uh, I taught school 25 years with Lamar School District, so uh, still, still bailing hay on, uh, uh, during the summertime and uh, selling insurance. and. I've always been involved with the Knights of Columbus uh, and uh, here at the St. Michael's Church. I've been a elector, a rosary leader, uh, altar boy. I still serve. Uh, I like to be involved and I don't particularly like going to a meeting. I like participating in a meeting and, and just, uh, I don't like just sitting there and, and not take part. So uh, but, uh, I'm able to give blood every 10 weeks or whatever it might be. And I just want to stay, stay active as I possibly can. Uh, my alarm goes off at 6.30. Seven o'clock, I'm having coffee with some buddies of mine, and eight o'clock, I'm usually back at the house, or I may do some running around in the morning, buy some supplies that I might need for that day. But uh, if nothing else, I'm gonna ride the fence line, get on my gator and ride the fence line and check for loose wires. And... On, uh, on March 13th, 2021, I received a phone call while I was actually at church. My husband was in an accident. Uh, he was being lifelighted to Memorial Hermann. Found him in the emergency room completely unresponsive. And they had not given me any hope and that he would even live through the night. Well, I say we have to work. It, it's more we need we need to have some sort of meaning. Uh, we need to have something to stay busy. It's also, I, I think, even through his brain injury, he has that need to do something. And, and there's something um, rewarding about just a job done. People ask now what I do. I mean, that's just a normal part of conversation. And it's always kind of that I pause because I don't really know how to answer. At one point I could say I worked in human resources. I did that for most of my career. It, before the accident, I was working as a special ed aide at our middle school. And John was doing sales. He's always done sales. And now people ask and there's just that pause because at this point, I'm a caregiver. He's a patient, a recovering TBI um, person. But the odd part in what, where it, I just, it doesn't even give it justice is that this is the most meaningful work and this is what God is calling me to do right now. I came to understand as I matured that where I start is not necessarily where I have to finish. My passion, which are my motivations, they changed. Where it was all about me, what I can get, who I can get, what people think about me, to how can I help you. And finally my purpose, I realized my purpose. Right before I was released, once again I was praying and God let me know in my heart that I'm not releasing you for your freedom, I'm releasing you for your purpose.
In front of these big questions and bold witnesses, we find ourselves rejecting any simplistic answers to why we work. We look for a bigger why. We wanted something we could compare against our experience. Father Sam Fontana shared the encyclicals on work and lessons from the liturgy itself as a proposal we could compare against our experience. So every Mass, when we bring bread and wine to be offered, ultimately to become the body of the Lord, to be offered back to us as food, we say a prayer that's based on kind of an, an ancient Hebrew prayer, just a, a prayer of thanksgiving and blessing. We say, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It'll become for us the bread of life. And actually, the 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 Latin the, the original Latin is a little more explicit that this bread is is fruit of the earth and fruit of the work of our hands. So it uses the word fruit twice. So in other words, like what we offer at mass is not wheat, you know, or it's not uh, you know like raw elements, you know, like the earth and the sky and the wind and the water. Um, like creation belongs to God already, you know, like it's already His and it already serves His purposes. Uh, and creation is so fruitful, you know, especially living out here in Southwest Louisiana, like to see the prairies in bloom, you realize like the great abundance that just happens, not because we plow or because we fertilize, like it just happens. So creation is fruitful, but that's not enough that we have to mix our work into the, into creation, into the mix. And then there's a greater fruitfulness that happens, right? So human art brings about a greater fruitfulness than merely nature uh, is able to provide. Um, and so when you go to mass, like that's what the priest is saying, that this bread is the fruit of the earth, but it's also the fruit of the work of our hands. And so symbolically that bread, it is bread, but it's symbolic of all of human labor. And I, and I try to teach my people this in the parish that that symbol is not just beautiful, that's meant to educate us and it's meant to actually speak to our reality. So like I tell my people, like when you go to mass, you have to be aware that what you're laying on the altar is everything that you've been thinking about or giving your attention to or worrying about or investing in over the last six or seven days, right? Because whatever, this is an idea of the fathers of the church, ancient fathers, whatever is not offered to God can't be transformed and received back. So there's an idea that people have um, that you need to take, you know, the, the sacrifice of the mass, take that grace and bring it out into the world. And that's a beautiful idea. Like we leave mass with that idea. But I would say what a lot of Christians don't understand is that it's not that the grace of the mass has to go out into the world. It's that the world has to come into the mass to be offered. I don't want to be one who just sits around the house and does nothing and I, I want to go to heaven <laughs> like everybody else does and I feel like I would to God to, to really help him out and, and do some things on his behalf and and uh, yeah, the more I can do for my community I feel like I'm doing it in God's name and so that's why I feel like I, I'm going to do as much as I can while I'm helping. Him.